Um, I was asked to talk about some sources that I used in researching the book that um, uh, is on tourism history. And, and so I've put together uh, four or five elements of what I think might at least make up part of what we might think of as a hippie archive. And of course there is no such thing as a hippie archive, but I, I think we can, there are, uh, there are materials that can help compile such a thing. And let me start with the idea of the internet as an archive, because I think in many ways uh, the internet is similar to an archive. It is a place where things are stored and the challenge is to find them. Um, we have certain tools such as internet searches. And so when I was writing the, my tourism book, I did a very simple search for two words, hippie, Nepal. And this was about 15 years ago when I had time, uh, I had a research period where I could sit down and work on this. At that time, a search for hippie Nepal came up with 10,000 hits. And I spent about two months going through one by one these 10,000 items. Um, and like in a real archive, most of what you find is irrelevant, it's worthless, it's rubbish. However, now and then, every now and then, you find that nugget of gold, and that's what makes archival research worthwhile. And so those nuggets that I found were things like um, references to newspaper articles that were not indexed, references to um, memoirs, references to um, <coughs> journal entries, photographs, all kinds of things appeared. And, and to be honest, uh, in, in no other previous research that I had done did I ever use the internet, and so I was surprised at what I found. And so, um, there were a lot of useful things, there were also, as I said, a lot of useless things, and even worse, there were a lot of things that were absolutely simply wrong, incorrect. So uh, many, many stories about how John Lennon came to Kathmandu, which he did not, or Jimi Hendrix came to Kathmandu, which he did not, and even Bob Marley coming to Kathmandu, which he did not. Um, but on the other hand, I found a lot of fascinating minute information. So for example, how much did it cost to rent a bicycle in 1967 if you were a tourist? I found on the internet. How much did it cost to sleep in the um, dormitory of the Camp Hotel in 1968? I found on the internet. And many, many other things. Um, one of the good and bad things about the internet is that it keeps growing. I said that 15 years ago I came up with 10,000 hits for hippie Nepal. Yesterday I did the same search and came up with 12.3 million. 12.3 million hits. And no doubt much of it is garbage. <clears throat> But I also know that some of, some of the items that have appeared on the internet just in the last few, just in the years since I published this book, <coughs> are really important items. For example, I found a hand-typed 200-page um, manuscript, an autobiographical manuscript by a man named Eight Finger Eddie, who was one of the leading hippie figures in the 60s and 70s, both here in Kathmandu and in Goa. And in that manuscript, he answered a number of questions that I had had to leave unanswered in my own research, and I wish that I had found it earlier. But it, did, it wasn't there earlier. So it keeps growing, it keeps getting more valuable, but the archive also gets more and more difficult to deal with. Maybe some of you who are skilled at search techniques can figure out how to sift through those 12.3 million. The other, of course, the other important part of an archive uh, for this topic are published sources. However, one of the things I found was that many of the most useful sources on the topic of hippie Nepal were memoirs 
that were printed privately, often by the authors themselves, in very small numbers, and that were very hard to get. Many of these items I found not through library catalog searches, because they don't appear in library catalogs. I found them on the internet. Uh, I found references to them. And in some cases, I was able to go right to somebody's website and purchase their book, privately published. One of the most important of these was a book by somebody named Joseph Petri, or Petrie, um, that was, this is the title, The King of Nepal, High Adventure Hashish Smuggling Through the Kingdom of Nepal, 2001. And this is, this is a, a wild character, um, someone I would actually not like to meet, I think, but um, he, he writes about his adventures as a, as a dope smuggler in the 60s and 70s until he got arrested by Interpol and uh, was in prison for a decade. And now he lives, uh, I, I presume, as a, a gentle old man in Indiana in the United States. But anyways, this is the kind of thing that I found on, um, on the internet. Published material, but difficult to find through libraries. On the other hand, there are things that I was able to find in libraries, um, including some very obscure things. Um, I had access through my university to something called World Cat, which is a, a global compilation of library catalogs from over 170 countries. And on, so with that, if you search on WorldCat, you can find books that um, in some cases may, uh, may be only two or three copies anywhere in the world, and you can find them. And in one, most, the most extreme case was a collection of poetry written by a hippie who lived in Nepal and uh, published this, this collection uh, in the early 70s. And in the entire world, it appears in one library, and that library was in Australia. And fortunately, I was able, the, the library in Australia was willing to make a PDF copy and sent it to me via email, so I have this, this text. But it, it, it's, so uh, the, these catalogs can be very important. Um, You know, one of the things that always happens when you publish a book is that as soon as you publish it, you find that there's all these other pieces of information that you should have included, including bibliography. And so um, there are many more uh, items that could be added to the bibliography of my book. But nevertheless, um, bibliographies themselves are important compilations of, of information. And, and when you find a book on a topic, for me, one of the first things I do is go to the bibliography. And that then leads in a hundred different directions that are sometimes productive. Unfortunately, there are not many good books available in print on, on, the, on the hippie era. And there's some that are, you know, downright bad. I, I won't name names, but I, I, there's some that I found that include extensive plagiarized passages and all kinds of stuff, which the author assumes that none of his readers will have known the background about. Okay, so published materials is a, a second part of a, of a potential hippie archive. Third are actual formal archives, and there's not a lot of material that I'm aware of in this category, but I am aware of at least the, the collections of two important individuals uh, who both happen to be Americans who were more or less hippies in the 60s and 70s, whose papers have been archived. One of these is Angus McLeese, who is not well known here, but in the United States, he is seen as a, uh, a founding figure in rock and roll, in punk music, and he spent almost the entire decade of the 1970s living in Swayambu. He died there in 1979 of a heroin overdose and was cremated here in, in Kathmandu. His, after his death, his widow 
put all of his papers in several large trunks and suitcases, left them with a friend in New York City, and they sat there for 40 years. Around 2010, um, an artist in New York found these materials, um, basically borrowed them from the person whose house it was sitting in, and put together an exhibition. So in 2010, I went to a, a, a gallery exhibition in, in New York City of Angus MacLeese's poetry books, his um, drawings, all kinds of artwork that, that were really marvelous. And the, the, the wonderful thing about this story is that after that exhibition, all of those materials were given to Columbia University, who has now formally archived all of them. The materials are cataloged, you can find them online. Unfortunately, they have not been digitized. So, uh, but at least they are cataloged and, and, and you can get a sense of what's there. For, for, for example, um, just looking through the, the items, there, there are a lot of things having to do with the Spirit Catcher bookstore that was here in, in Freak Street. Um, the, the Rose Mushroom Disco, which was another early hashish joint, and, and, and many other things. The other person whose materials have been archived is Ira Cohen, who is another, again, figure more well known in the United States than here, but who also spent most of the 1970s in Kathmandu. He was a poet, a filmmaker, uh, a photographer, he died in 2011, and his materials have also been archived, in this case, in the Yale University archive, where you can, again, go to the website and, and see. Um, according to the websites, the Angus MacLeese archive, it has 22.5 feet, shelf feet of material. The Ira Cohen has 133 shelf feet of archive material, so we're talking large amounts of, of stuff. Sadly, as I said, it has not been digitized, and I doubt if it will have the priority to be digitized any soon. But still, these two represent what may be just part of a larger potential archive. Uh, a fourth category of, a, of an archive is something that I personally have not had experience with, but it was something that I learned about from talking to actually people here at Nepal. Uh, in particular, it was Pravash Gautam, who is a journalist and historian who's written about, among other things, on, on topics of, of hippie Kathmandu, who told me that he's found a lot of good information on Facebook. I do not do Facebook, but he does, and he found user groups of people who had lived here back in the 60s and 70s. Through those groups, he began making contacts with people, and he, you know, he, he was able to interview people on the other side of the world via the, you know, via the internet and Facebook. Um, people who, for example, people who I had only known through their publications or through references, he's actually talked to. <laughs> and, uh, and so th this is what's possible. Finally, I, I want to mention that you know, so far what I've been talking about uh, of an archive of hippie Nepal has been mainly de materials dealing with foreigners. And of course the other, other half of that story is the Nepali experience of that era. And unfortunately, when it comes to archives of the Nepali experience, the, these, these are minimal. Uh, perhaps, aside from some photographs, uh, not much is there. However, what is there are the people. And, and I want to end my remarks by simply noting that if, if an archive is, a stored, is stored knowledge, then it is up to us to create the archive that will be the Nepali experience of, of the hippie era. And that's in the form, it's going to be in the form of oral histories. It's going to be collecting photographs. It's going to be collecting artworks, 
all kinds of stuff is, is potential, there's potential to collect. And so in other words, there's still time to create an archive that would document the Nepali experience of the hippie era. But the time is not, the time is limited because the people who have this knowledge won't be around forever. And so it's crucial to get out there and, and actually make the archive. Don't rely on other people to have already made it. Make it yourself. Um, if we can compile oral histories, that'll be a big step toward creating an archive of that experience. I'll stop, thank you. Mm.